Welcome to the SQL Century webinar. I'm Kevin Klein. One thing I want to encourage everybody to take advantage of if you haven't yet already, we have a series of ebooks that we produce. These aren't little throwaway books. These are hefty volumes full of information from some of the best SQL Server experts in the industry. Normally $10 in the Kindle Amazon bookstore. If you send us an email at ebooks, at sqlcentury.com, we will send those to you for free. We'll give you a promo code, you can download all of those for free. Today, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about queries, different things that can help you get better at writing SQL queries. And today's session is about the plan cache. It's one of the two really, really big areas inside of SQL Server's buffer. And the other is the data cache. So we have the, the plan cache for all of the stored procedures and triggers and uh, user-defined functions and, and as well as your you know regular batches that you submit and we are going to talk about some of the problems and important aspects of managing this you can see there the four main things that I'm going to talk about in terms of problems with a plan cache and so let's jump into the first topic here plan cache bloat so one of the things that happens a lot inside of SQL Server is that we don't really realize or know a lot about the way SQL Server handles the different bits of code that we submit to it, whether that's in compiled code through stored procedures or ad hoc code through you know select statements maybe that were written and submitted directly from SQL Server Management Studio or some kind of reporting tool. There are things that we can do that will encourage SQL Server to reuse the execution plans that are loaded into the cache. Conversely, there are things that we can do that really screw it up and make it really hard for SQL Server to cache a plan or to keep it active in the cache for a long time. So one of the things I always like to point out is the importance of coding standards. It's not really crucial that you use the coding standards I like. Uh, you know, I personally am the kind of person who likes all of my keywords to be in uppercase, things like select, insert, so forth. Those would all be in uppercase. All the object names would be in lowercase. AdventureWorks 2014. Sales order header or something like that. That would be in lowercase. So it's not important that you use my standards even though they're right and they're the best standards, but what, <laughs> I joke. But what is most important is that you do use standard consistently. Let me jump right into a demo and show you a little bit of that in action right off the bat. Here's some code I've got that will just warm up the cache. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and, and let, I'm gonna execute that in the background. And so I'm selecting from some views because I know these views are actually multi-table constructs that pull in data from a lot of different tables and so forth. And then some of these are more elaborate, so we have some fairly large execution plans that are going to get loaded into the cache. It's just a little bit of work to get things moving inside, inside of SQL Server. Now, this is going to be uh, one of two main scripts that I'm going to provide to you. You'll be able to download those from the blog page. I will have given you some nice details so that when you come back and read this, it'll all make sense, even though I'm not talking through the different aspects of, of this, and you know I'm not looking over your shoulder. I've got some links so that you can find more detail. What I was saying just a moment ago, let's say, for example, we have a lot of people on our team and we all write our particular stored procedures, triggers, views, functions, ad hoc queries, whatever, each one of us just according to our, our own way of doing things. Now, in SQL Server, uh, or actually I should say in the real world, I can see that this query here, select the top one record from the sales order ID, the top one record from the sales order detail table. I can uh, select the top sales order ID from the sales order detail table. Semantically, these are identical. The only difference is that there's a carriage return and that we start each new line with a carriage return, right? SQL Server, surely, is going to be able to tell me that um, these are the same query and I can reuse those, right? Well, let's, let's go ahead and execute those. Whoops, you know what? I didn't clear the cache first, so let me go ahead and do that. Sorry about that. This statement, DBCC free procedure cache, will clear out the procedure cache. Free system cache will clear out individual caches, uh, individual subcomponents of the cache. For example, if we wanted to clear out just the, oh, I don't know, the ad hoc um, elements of the, of the plan cache, or maybe a specific pool of a resource governor. Now we'll be able to see 
this a little bit more clearly. Okay, two virtually identical execution plans, correct? So I've executed both of them. They both find the same results. Now, again, SQL Server surely can tell that these are the same thing, and we'll reuse it. But look at that. We actually have those two lines appearing with a use count of one. Now, this couldn't be a smaller SQL statement, and yet it still takes up 24.6 kilobytes inside of the cache. So two executions, virtually the same, and yet they are as separate entries in the execution plan. Now, in this case, look here, just one extra space, okay? Semantically the same. Execute that again. Now, SQL Server, you know, this is a smart database engine, one of the, one of the best ever created. Surely, nope, it didn't, it didn't see that that's the same thing, and so it created a new entry into the plan cache. Now, here, let's go ahead and select the, the, the top one, same as before, except I'm not going to do camel case as I did in the one before. Okay, I'm just going all lowercase. Again, semantically equivalent, right? Uh, we shouldn't have any problem at all with this. SQL Server should, well, no, it's now got four entries in the, each one of these now taking up about 25K, so we're up to 100K for this tiny little query. Now we're going to try, hey, you know what, let's do it with lowercase keywords here. You know, and SQL Server's smart, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to know that it can reuse that. It's exactly the same thing. And no, it doesn't know that. It actually creates another entry for that each time. The thing to keep in mind here is that when SQL Server creates an execution plan and it creates the query plan, goes through the whole optimization process, it actually takes a hash of whatever your SQL statement is and looks at the binary values and puts those binary values into the plan cache. And it's from that basic set of binary values that it builds its query fingerprint and so forth. And speaking in terms of binary, a lowercase s is a different binary value than an uppercase s, right? They're not the same thing. So to a human being, we can semantically tell the, that these mean the same thing, but a computer doesn't know that. You know, a computer only knows what we tell it. It does things really, really fast, faster than a person can, but it does not know things that just come naturally to human beings. And it doesn't have its own imagination to know that this is not a stretch. It's a reusable thing. And so if you have a team that is coding to their own individual preferences and not coding to standards, you're going to be very, very likely to see excessive plan cache bloating where we're not actually uh, making good use of the amount of space we have in the cache, and we're reusing lots of different variations of the same statement, uh, where under normal circumstances, if we had uh, adhered to good standards and made sure everybody wrote their code in the same way, SQL Server would know that these are actually all the same plan. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is suboptimal plans, okay? With suboptimal plans, SQL Server tries to make the best choice. Uh, it uses something called a cost-based optimizer to figure out uh, what is the, you know, the optimal execution plan. But then there are lots of things that we might do that cause SQL Server to choose a poorly performing plan or, in fact, to never even cache a plan. So there is a particular kind of execution plan called a trivial plan. SQL Server considers a plan trivial with some certain rules, you know, it knows it's not going to select from five tables, for example. It's only going to select from one or two tables. And typically, a trivial plan is one in which there is really only one usable execution plan that's really going to work. You might have a trivial plan for something like select get date, just to pull the system date, or a top value from a very small table with 12 rows in it. So those are trivial plans. There is also the fact that certain kinds of statements do not ever cache plans just because of the way that the optimizer likes to handle these things. So bulk inserts, for example, uh, those plans are not cached. Queries of various sorts that are written against read-only databases or files, file groups, those are also not cached. Then there's also a bunch of uh, strange rules that can prevent things from being cached. For example, uh, batches that have a literal value that's longer than 8,000 bytes, those aren't cached. 
Now, keep in mind that the 8,000 bytes is after something called constant folding is applied. So if you have a literal that's passed in and has some kind of function put on it, like a substring or maybe a length function, the value produced after that function is applied is after we do the constant folding. So if we have a constant, a literal that is, and it's greater than 8,000 after all the work that you've done on it is completed, then it won't be cached. Uh, those that are flagged for replication, those that are called by CLR initially, and then are called by something outside of CLR later on. That could be just a regular ad hoc batch. That could be a stored procedure. It could be triggers. It could be uh, notification queries. The, they will all fail if it was called first inside of CLR and then later on outside of CLR. However, if any of those kinds of different pieces of code are called inside, both are called inside, then those plans can be reused. There's some rules around cursors, um, and so if the cursor is called separately from the batch, then those might not be cached. And then another one, uh, I like to point this out, a series of webcasts that you can view right now on SQL Century TV talks about how set option values can cause your plans to be suboptimal. What happens in a suboptimal plan, and again I'll go over to a demo here, in suboptimal plans we're basically giving SQL Server mixed signals. For example, if our execution context is very different, we execute the plan uh, under one user ID and under the same uh, connection, then we execute it as someone else. Maybe we, so we've changed the user info, we've changed the parameters heavily. Uh, another example of a suboptimal plan, and a lot of people don't realize this, is if you have a huge query that has lots of conditionality in it. So the query is set up to handle if this and then that, and if something else, then another results. If uh, option three, then go down another branch. Well, SQL Server has a really hard time figuring out what it needs to do in a situation like that. So SQL Server often will choose the least offensive execution plan to these many different options. And so what you get is one that is not good for any SQL statement. And then, as I said a moment ago, we have a variety of set conditions. And if, if there's any conflict between the user connection and the server or the database or even the, let's say, the stored procedure, you know, you set ANZ nulls on inside of a stored procedure, but the user connection string has something besides set ANZ null on, then you will have uh, some problems. And so what will happen is SQL Server won't be able to reuse the existing plan as it already exists in there. Now, before we go on too much further, let me show you some additional queries about what is going on inside of the SQL Server cache, uh, the different areas of cache. As I mentioned a moment ago, the two biggest areas are the data cache and the plan cache. There are lots of other small caches. Uh, there's sorts and hash buckets, and there's different caches for X events and things like that. But here we'll just take a look at all of the different uh, databases, how many pages they have cached uh, at a given moment. And so we can see that the buffer pool, buffer pool pages in megabytes, it's mostly AdventureWorks, and we've got some TempDB and Sales Data Mart. We've got, you know, a variety of different um, uh, tables and their data and their indexes loaded into the, into the buffer cache. Now, this is the plan cache, DMOS memory cache counters. And so we're just going to see the areas inside of the plan cache object plans, SQL plans, bound trees, and so forth. And so here, we're getting a, a little bit of a taste of how much of the total amount of memory that's being used just to store objects of different kinds, okay? And you can see that we have very little extended stored procedures, we have very little table variables and temp tables in the cache. Most of it is in, um, in the objects. Compiled, that's what CP means here, compiled. Compiled object, compiled SQL, and, and such. Now, we might also want to look at the query optimizer. And so here we can see some other elements of what is going on with the query optimizer. For example, number of timeouts and um, memory limits exceeded all kinds of things that tell us what is happening overall, uh, uh, ever-increasing sort of numbers happening for the uh, 
the query optimizer. And this can be really useful if you're bouncing between a couple different kinds of, um, a couple different versions of SQL Server. It might be uh, different one from another. Maybe you've got two service packs, one applied on one and one uh, a different service pack applied on another one. So <clears throat> that can be uh, useful to know if you have different uh, kinds of behavior there as well. So here, just decide to take a look and see all the different buckets and see how much, um, how many times they have been, um, excuse me, uh, how many times they've appeared here, the, the count of those particular objects. Uh, now we could look at it for a specific ID if we wanted to and get a lot more information. Let's change this number. Let me just run a, a cross apply on these and we'll get a ton of information back. That way you can see what it looks like. So here it's just telling us the type of object, the object ID, the size, and again, you know, these could be really big. They could be really bloated, particularly if it's the same thing and it's loaded over and over and over again uh, in the cache. Now, this one is really useful. I used it just a moment ago with the showing you uh, the various differences in that one simple query, how many times these particular uh, objects in the cache have been used. And if we have a preponderance of compiled plans that are in the cache that have a usage count of one, meaning they are not reused, you know, that's a pretty big red flag. We, we need to know that um, the code that we're generating is being optimally reused by our applications. Now here I'm going to take out some of the kind of routine stuff and actually we're not going to lose too much of our of our result set here. Still pretty much the same because we don't use a lot of extended stored procedures or things like that. Uh, you can use a top statement to find out your, your most frequently used plans, your least frequently used plans. We could uh, check to see what the total memory uh, usage is. This is from a different table, hash, uh, DMOS memory cache hash tables. And so this is telling us a little bit different information here. Uh, misses and hits on the cache. That's that's pretty useful stuff right there. So again, uh, when we're looking at optimal query plans, we want SQL Server to be able to reuse those query plans as much as it possibly can. Now there's a couple reasons why it might not be able to reuse a plan. One is because there's something in the way we've coded it, like I described here. We've done something that causes it not to be reusable. And I'll show you some other things in just a moment that can cause SQL Server uh, not to cache the plan in the first place, but to do something kind of a variant of that in which it is going to cache the plan, but then realize that it can't use it. But first, let's talk about another really, really important technology involved in SQL Server's behavior, and that is aging in the cache. So SQL Server wants to keep things in the plan cache as long as it can. Right. And, and it actually has very, very detailed algorithms. Basically, what I want you to understand here on this slide is, you know, the general abstract concepts. If you are really, really interested and want to know a whole lot of details about how SQL Server handles the plan cache, read the slide notes. And then I tell you all about how the cost is derived from a couple different elements of metadata and how it keeps track of these different costs. Basically, uh, the use of ticks, it calculates uh, a number of ticks. It's a rather complex algorithm of I.O. costs plus context switches plus memory costs and all kinds of things like that. Two I.O.s get one tick and, you know, all kinds of rules around that. But what I want to get for you here is the, the general idea. And so follow along here. We've got the plan cache, that's section of SQL Server's memory set aside for the execution plans. And we have several different pieces of code. We have a find user piece of T-SQL code. We have stored procedure one, stored procedure two. And for each of these, there's some metadata that is created. One is a complexity value. This is how complex it is. And then the second one is a complexity counter, okay? Now, we call a new piece of code, get order, and it's quite a bit more complex than the others. It's more than twice as complex. It's got a complexity value of 16 and a counter of 16. Now, about every minute or so, 
the lazy writer wakes up and takes a look around. The lazy writer process is one you might have noticed in your, your different SPIDs. If you look at the SPIDs at number less than 50, lazy writer is one of them that you'll see in there. If you've looked at weight statistics, you'll see lazy writer sleep task is a weight statistic that's really high on your list. So there's an asterisk at the end of the statement that goes into all the, the nuances of it, but generally speaking, the lazy writer wakes up about once a minute and takes a look at all of the code in the plan cache. It can happen under other circumstances. A, a thread can ask for a, you know, a reconciliation of all these values. Some things like that can happen. Uh, and so any of these that haven't been used since the last time that the lazy writer was active, all of those that weren't used get decremented by one. Okay? And then the lazy writer goes away, sleeps for a minute, comes back, takes another look around, see what's happened in the last minute. And again, uh, if, it, if these different pieces of code haven't been used, they get decremented again. Now, goes away. He plans to come back in a minute, but before Lazy Writer comes back, let me ask you, what do you think is going to happen to these pieces of code that have a value of zero, right? That's a, that's a reasonable question to ask. Well, let's see. The, the Lazy Writer will come back. We'll take a look around and see what's going on inside. If no one has used these, of course they all get decremented again, same as before. What happened to this though? The results are, the answer is, I guess you could say, it depends, right? It depends on memory pressure. So if there isn't any memory pressure, uh, you see this particular object in the cache has not actually been deleted. It has been what SQL Server calls ghosted. And so if there's not memory pressure, SQL Server allows it to stay alive in the cache. Why not? You know, somebody might ask for it soon. On the other hand, if there is memory pressure, then SQL Server will boot it out right away with another process called the ghost cleanup process. So you may have even noticed the ghost cleanup process as you've tinkered around on SQL Server. Now the next time the lazy writer comes back, looks to see if anyone has used any of these, and as this algorithm says, LRU means least recently used. So it's looked for those that haven't been used in a while, and that's what it would get rid of, except for this dash K here, and that means with the exception for complexity. So least recently used aside from complexity. So the more complex it is, the longer it can stay in the cache. The less complex it is, the more the assumption is we don't mind recompiling it. So one that has a value of only three, for example, that's, that's next to nothing. So we don't mind recompiling that often if end users need that code. But if it's really big and complex like this get order, we want that to stay in the cache for a long time because SQL Server is pretty convinced that uh, this is going to be a real bear to recompiling, build a new effective execution plan. So let's go easy on that. The more complex it is, the more chances we give it to stay alive in the cache. Okay. Now, let's move on. That's what happens uh, in the plan cache. If you're wondering what happens in the buffer cache, it's about the same thing. And that's the biggest generalization uh, a human being can make. So in general, it tries to keep heavily used stuff uh, around at the same time, you know, in the same way. However, there's lots and lots and lots of different heuristics that it applies, like whether it's clustered or non-clustered or just a complete heap that has no in indexes, how many indexes it has, how big the indexes are, how big the table is. So in all of its find nuances, there's a lot of different choices that it makes with a buffer cache. There's a lot of rules. We should do a whole session just on the buffer cache because it's, it's really, really tricky uh, on that one. So this is, a, this is an important technique that you are, uh, important technology, uh, an architectural underpinning of SQL Server that you need to understand um, as we get into this discussion a little bit deeper. One more that you need to understand recompiles. Okay. Now, SQL Server will automatically try to use any statements that it can rather than to generate a new one. The reason for that is because SQL Server assumes that it's going to be tough to get a new execution plan. 
it has all of these really, really smart decisions that it makes as it goes through the normal, query normalization and query optimization process. And so it tries to make that as fast as it can. In a situation where we're going to execute some code, the first thing SQL Server does is it looks to see if it's in memory. And if you'll harken back a few minutes ago to that first, very first demo that we did, we can make mistakes. You know, we can write the code in such a way that it won't find it in memory. But assuming that it takes a look and it does find the exact same code in memory, what it will do is it will kind of short circuit the process and, and execute. If it doesn't find the object that it needs in memory, a stored procedure or ad hoc piece of code, then it'll load up the metadata, compiles it and optimizes it, goes through the four step query optimization process and executes it. However, there are situations in which SQL Server will go through that whole process get part of the way through the code and realize that it can't really complete that full execution without recompiling it before it continues. So just to give you a few examples, recompiles certainly happened because we've told it to. Maybe we created a stored procedure with the recompile setting, or we, we did an execute on a stored procedure with the recompile setting, or we said recompile everything based on this object and it'll recompile all of the stored procedures and things like that. Of course, we just talked about plans aging out of cache. So that's another reason why SQL Server might have to recompile. If you have a really active SQL Server, you might think it should stay in cache. You know, here we are 10 seconds later, but it's actually already aged out of cache because there's so much going on that it's been forced to uh, move that particular piece of code out of cache. There are a whole set of problems, though, with causing SQL Server not to be able to complete code without recompiling. My biggest one is the interleaving of DDL and DML. DDL is, uh, and DML, these are abbreviations for subsets of the SQL language standard. So DDL is the data dictionary language that is create, alter, and drop statements. And then DML is all of the data manipulation language statements. So that's select, insert, update, delete, and the merge statement. If we interleave those together, even if the DDL is for, say, creating a temporary table, that's still a DDL statement. And so if we follow that DDL with a, uh, a DML statement, which we would naturally do, that would cause SQL Server to have to recompile before it compl could complete. Remember, when we create a table or we tinker around with a table, SQL Server says, you know what, I don't think the statistics are effective anymore, so I need to go back and recheck everything. When it does that, it's got to build a new execution plan. So just as this DDL and DML interleaving those counts as a schema change to SQL Server, if someone else does a schema change to an object that we're working on in our code, uh, we will probably have to recompile. So if someone adds a column to a table where we're doing some work, SQL Server will recompile. If we have new or updated index statistics, if someone else elsewhere on the server runs an update statistics statement on a table that we're using, boom, that query will recompile. And then also certain SP configure settings. So if you change one of the important underlying components like maybe max degrees of parallelism or cost threshold for parallelism, then SQL Server will create a new execution plan to see if it can take advantage of these new or forced to not take advantage of particular um, uh, resources available to it. Let's say if someone changed an affinity mask type setting, then it would say, oh, I can't use that CPU or these extra CPUs anymore. And so it would have to create a new execution plan. Okay. But the big one that I find that uh, developers do over and over again without realizing it's a, it's a big issue is when they interleave the DDL and the DML together in a batch of SQL code, whether that's inside of a um, inside of a stored procedure or just a batch or however that might be constructed, okay? So, you know, you create a stored procedure and then within that you create a temporary table to hold some data and then you insert into that table, like I show here, and then you alter the table by adding a column, let's say subtotals, and then you have an update statement where you update the subtotals value and accumulate uh, some numbers there. And then you you know, insert some more records and then you drop the table. So each time we would have more and more recompiles anytime we have these two alternating together. 
there are some ways you can get around that. You could, for example, have all of your DML statements up, or DDL statements up at the top so that there's no interleaving. You could refactor it so there's just one create table statement and then none of these alter statements. You could actually use table variable. Now, I don't encourage that because table variables have their own set of downsides that are pretty pretty big. Uh, the main one is that they don't have, they don't keep track of any statistics. However, there are situations where you know it's only going to be a dozen records or something like that, so you could use a table variable. All right, so let me show you a few more things in demo, but I want to talk about suboptimal queries just a little bit more around the idea of parameters, okay? Now, we saw some stuff that would cause the queries that are cached to get kicked out. They might get aged out of cache through a natural process based on how complex they are. They might get kicked out because there's something about them that they can no longer be used or because there's not quite a match between the, uh, the various versions of it. So semantically, they look the same, but in fact, to SQL Server, binary-wise, they are different. Another suboptimal kind of thing that happens a lot is that I see, and this might be because of ORMs like Entity Framework or, I don't know, Link to SQL or in Hibernate, but I do see a lot of queries or stored procedures that are kind of a kitchen sink approach. You know, it's, let's handle every problem with this one stored procedure. I've even seen stored procedures that are designed to both insert and update and delete. And so the first parameter in is which of those do you want me to do? Do you want me to insert data or do you want me to select data out of this table? And boy, that is that is bad <laughs> for a number of reasons. The, the biggest though is that SQL Server will have to cache all of the code that it doesn't use very much. So let's say updates are only 5% of the total amount of work. It's got to cache all that code. And as you saw in the example of plan cache bloating, a single line or two of code can equal, you know, dozens and dozens of kilobytes of consumption of the plan cache space. So that means 95% of the time that we call that stored procedure, we're wasting all the, the space for the update statement. In fact, for the other three statements of whatever we're not doing, we waste that space. The other thing too, is that when we have a kitchen sink stored procedure, SQL Server, without a doubt, works best when the code is specialized. And so if we have a situation in which we have, we're passing it dynamic SQL or we're uh, constructing you know, this kind of thing that says, if the value is null, then get all the records, but if a value is passed in for this parameter, give me where customer ID equals all of them or this one specific one. What happens is it can't really choose good execute, execution plans. And parameterization, in that case, can hurt us. So let me show you some examples of why that's the case. All right, so first thing I want to bring to your attention is you want to know if you're experiencing a lot of recompiles. So there's two ways to look at that. The first is to look at the cache. And so here I'm just going to look at the top 25 items in the cache. I'm going to look at the query stats and the SQL text with a plan generation number of greater than one. Okay, this means it's had to, had to be basically recompiled. So let's take a look and see what we've got here. So some of these have been recompiled hundreds of times. Okay, 400, 408, 407, 209, 208 and so forth as we go down the list, okay? So you can see that some of these are very frequently recompiled. Uh, another way you can look at how much recompilation is happening on our SQL Server is to look at the perfmon counters. And one of the things I really like about the later versions of SQL Server, they have made it possible for us to see all of the perfmon counters that relate to SQL Server from a DMV. So we can't see the Windows perfmon counters, but we certainly can see the SQL ones. And if you haven't seen this little bit of nomenclature right here at the end where you say go 10, 
this only works in Management Studio. It doesn't work if you're calling it from, say, iSQL or OSQL or one of the kind of SQL command lines or something like that. Uh, it doesn't work in a batch uh, if you're ingesting a, a Transact SQL batch from a text file. It only works in Management Studio, but this says execute the previous piece of code 10 times. I doubt we'll see any changes in the numbers because this isn't a very heavily uh, utilized server, but we can see what the value for the compiles versus recompiles are on this server. And the reason I highlight both of those, compiles versus recompiles, is that on a typical OLTP transaction processing system, there's a kind of a rule of thumb that you don't want this to be more than one out of five or no more than maybe one out of four in the worst of situations to uh, of compiles to of recompiles to compiles okay so if i had as much as say 20 percent compiles to recompiles to compiles that's when i'd start getting alarmed if it crossed over that threshold i'd say okay i've got some code that's not written very well and is causing recompiles to happen a lot and it really should not be doing that so that's one thing you can keep an eye on over time and see if this is an issue if you're wondering wow that's a lot of work uh, just as an FYI this is the sort of thing that the, the you know most of the pl the paid tools keep a, a, an eye on for you automatically so let me just show you that as well in in our tool performance advisor and I apologize, it's, uh, it's moving quite slow. But you can see here where we've got our SQL Server activity. We've got batches per second, transactions per second, compiles, and recompiles. Uh, that's what this dot, dot, dot means. There's recompiles over there. So uh, when we click on these different items, we can see how much uh, some of these things are happening and, and if this is a particular problem on that SQL Server. There's also something called an activity monitor inside of Management Studio. Um, I don't encourage you to use it all the time because it's very heavy. It's got a lot of overhead. But um, if you uh, just needed to do a, a quick look and you wanted to take a look at system performance at a time when you know things are working okay, then I'm, you know, I might use that if I had, you know, if I didn't have any other means of kind of visualizing what was happening inside of the SQL Server. So let's talk about parameterization a little bit more and how SQL Server handles that. So this is another way in which we might not realize that we're causing SQL Server to choose less than optimal plans. Now keep in mind, these recompiles happen no matter how you submit your code. It could be ad hoc query in batches. It could be stored procedures or user-defined functions or triggers, any of those things. SQL Server basically does the same sort of thing with recompiles throughout. In fact, it, it's not actually uh, really related that much to things like, you know, whether you're keeping up well with your indexes or not. Uh, there are some exceptions to that rule, and I'll show you that in a minute with parameter sniffing. But uh, those recompiles uh, usually happen for other reasons, and so it applies to pretty much all the, the transact SQL you might push into a SQL Server. So again, talking about parameters, the only difference in these two queries is that we are asking for a different value of product ID. So when we execute these, a SQL Server behind the scenes would create an auto-parameterized version in which this, this value is shown as a parameter. And SQL Server could say, hey, you know what? doesn't matter whether I use one, whether 100 or 200 is passed in. I found it in the plan cache and I'm set up for parameterization and so I'll go ahead and use that existing plan that already exists. And so that can give you some benefits. Okay, If you are always using exec to call code, I'd encourage you to start looking at SP execute SQL. In fact, I'm going to talk about that on the next slide that I go to in a few moments. When you use SP execute SQL, that kind of forces you to declare, strongly declare, the parameters. So it is automatically built for parameterization. Parameter sniffing is a, is a problem where, like in this example, or I'll show you in another example, in fact, right here, there are uh, a couple versions of this code 
where we have only one record. So if we were to parameterize the customer ID, there's only one record in the AdventureWorks database that has this ID, or that is greater than this ID. However, if we were to say greater than 10,000, there are tons that are bigger. And so SQL Server takes a look at a number of different aspects uh, when it's figuring out the execution plan. And so one of the big ones that it'll look at is kind of the statistical sampling or the statistical values for the indexes and something called a cardinality estimate. So it might say, okay, I'm only going to get one record back. Let me put all of that into the metadata for this particular ad hoc SQL into the cache. And so when I execute this, and this applies to stored procedures as well, the first time that stored procedure gets executed, it builds its execution plan based on that first value that goes into it. There are exceptions again to these, all of these rules have their own exceptions. There's a, 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 a setting I encourage you to look at called optimize for ad hoc workloads if you actually do have a lot of people turning in ad hoc work. And what happens there is it doesn't cache it with the first value. It puts a stub into the cache on the first value and then the second time it is called is when it builds, the full, builds out the full execution plan based on that value. If you don't have that enabled, now SQL Server has built an execution plan for one result set, expecting one record back. But then later on, when we come back and execute it at a later date, and it has lots of records, it may choose to do something entirely different. Now, I have to admit that I have not checked this plan to see if we have very, very different execution plans here. So I see it's doing a clustered index seek. It has a key lookup, which means that's a pretty good opportunity to either add an index or uh, include a column in an existing index. So I see a clustered index seek, key lookup, and a non-clustered index seek. Let's see what it looks like now when we execute it for a parameter that will have a result set of lots and lots of rows. Uh, and a question has come up, by the way, while we wait for this to process. Um, why are the queries that we have in our system, uh, why they get recompiled even if the query is in memory? So the short answer to that is that um, SQL Server has some reason or another in which it feels like it can't actually reuse that execution plan. So because of that, it has to generate a whole new one. Uh, and that's, that's why it does that. For example, it thinks that it's going to use uh, an entirely different table than what it used before. Or the table has changed. Now, a new column has been added or any number of things like that. That's, that's one of the main reasons why things get recompiled. Okay, so in this particular example, notice that we had index seeks before and now we just have two scans. All right. Now, the next question that you might be asking yourself is, that looks bad. Uh, you know, clustered index scan is going to, you know, it's going to grab a lot more records. But are all parameter sniffing situations bad? And the answer to that is no. A lot of times that's not bad. So you would want to go through the steps of query tuning to make sure that the way this query is behaving with all of these different parameters is sensible and is performing best for your workload. Uh, I cover that in some of the other videos that are available on SQL Century TV if you want to learn how to use the various set statistics I.O. and set statistics time statement, things like that. So that will help you understand all of those things. Now, another thing you can do is you can use some of these option statements. Okay. Now, in my case, my favorite one is to use option recompile, which says that each time we run this statement, go ahead and generate a new plan. The assumption that an execution plan is going to be really expensive and really difficult to generate is kind of based on the old days when servers didn't have a lot of CPUs and the CPUs weren't that fast and we didn't have a lot of memory. But a lot of the time I find now that it's, it's not that big of a deal. 
to you know for a query this size perhaps so for a very very large query yeah that can definitely be tough and you might not want to recompile it each time but if it is simple and short then I might not mind that SQL Server just generates a new plan for it another thing you can do is if you know that SQL Server is much more likely to get this kind of query, a singleton query looking for one value, and then every now and then it is going to get one that looks for more than one, you know, a, a whole bunch of values, you could use this optimize for and tell it to, you know, to, to cache that plan, and then SQL Server will build out that execution plan, and that will be the one that it will find in, in, the, uh, in the plan cache. Now keep in mind this is data type specific, so if we had a character value here, or a varchar, or any of those other ones, I'd need to put it in quotes, but since this one is an integer, I leave it unquoted. And then there's another optimize uh, option that's sometimes useful, which is optimize for unknown, which is a lot like uh, recompile. Basically we tell it, I have no idea what value you may get, so you need to leave your options open. And so SQL Server is, take that into consideration as it builds out its execution plan. All right, so that's some other useful tips there for minimizing parameter sniffing. Now again, it's not always a bad thing. When it's reusing a particular plan based on a specific set of parameters that are being called very frequently, then great. But if it's using ones that are way different than what you need for it to use, then that is less than great. All right, so we just have another slide, and then we'll be wrapping up. I mentioned just a moment ago that you could use, instead of the exec statement, you could use SP execute SQL. Now, this is my preferred way of doing things because it really does promote better plan reuse. And it forces you basically to have really strongly typed parameters instead of building a you know big massive dynamic string of SQL code like we see in in dynamic SQL it can help with uh, preventing SQL injection as well now if you use bad practices when you set up an SP execute call it can still do the exact same that the exec statement can and you know pass whatever code you create for it back to SQL Server including a SQL injection attack. But if you do it the right way, the way it's supposed to be done, it helps get away from issues with implicit or explicit conversion, gets rid of, gets us away from issues of parameters and parameter sniffing. So investigate those options as well. And again, this is something I have a demo of in SQL Century TV. So if you wanted to look at that particular tip or one of the uh, query tuning best practices, videos you'll see that at SQL Century TV. All right so to wrap up we're at the end of the hour a couple things to be aware of when it comes to the plain cache the first is bloat. Bloat can happen from a number of different ways the most common way is if we have basically the same SQL statements being written in a lot of different ways some uppercase some lowercase some mixed case and so each time SQL Server is going to cache an additional copy of that plan. It can also happen because we write those kitchen sink stored procedures and we force it to, ex to compile a plan for every eventuality when in fact SQL Server works way better if we have very specialized code and you know a piece of code that does just one thing and it does it really really well. So try to avoid those kitchen sink pieces of code maybe a stored procedure that does inserts, updates, deletes, and select statements, or maybe uh, a stored procedure that looks at every eventual condition, you know, if this value, then branch one, if that value, then branch two, if another value, then branch three. Well, uh, maybe you can check that on, uh, on the start of the code and then move out to a stored procedure for each particular eventuality of those branches rather than including all of that into one. Lots of different ways to handle that. Parameters, as I say here in bullet point three, parameters are not bad, but parameter sniffing can be bad, particularly if it's choosing suboptimal ways of doing it. So what you want to do is make sure that you know the code well enough 
to ensure that the execution plans work well under all circumstances. And then finally, you want to make sure that SQL Server recompiles appropriately. Now, as I said before, there's a kind of a natural ratio that most well-coded systems support. Maybe one out of four, one out of five compiles might be recompiled, and that's uh, a number up to that is is pretty conceivable, you know, it's not, not a terribly bad thing. Uh, if it goes over that though, definitely start looking into it right away. Okay, as we wrap up, keep in mind I'm just about to write a blog post and post it at blogs.sqlcentury.com where you'll be able to get the code for all of this as well as the slide deck. Also, I will be posting the video at sqlcentury.tv and so you can come back and watch it again later or if you have any friends or co-workers who are interested in learning more about the SQL Server Plan Cache, please point them to that to SQL Century TV so that they can read more and learn more about it. If you're active on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, I always enjoy connecting and you know meeting new people. And you can send me questions directly at uh, kcline at sqlcentury.com.